This holiday season, give more wow from the mills, and you'll hear more, oh, you shouldn't have, more, you're the best, more, how did you know, and even more, I love you. Give more wow for the holidays from the mills. Knockout brands, knockout prices. At Sawgrass Mills, we're ready for the holidays. On Thanksgiving Day, doors open at 10 a.m. and stay open until midnight. On Black Friday, shop from 6 a.m. until 10 p.m. For more info, visit SawgrassMills.com. Sawgrass Mills, a Simon Center. Blog Talk Radio. I am your host, Yvonne Mason, and this will be the only show that we're doing this week because it's the beginning of the silly season. And those of you that know me know how much I do indeed hate the silly season, but apparently other people enjoy it. So in honor of those who do enjoy it, we will not have any more shows this week because there are people getting ready for Thanksgiving and family and friends and don't want to impose on that. But we will be back next Wednesday night with author, martial arts artist, artist, Tom Futrell, also known as Reaper. But tonight we have a wonderful, wonderful guest. I've known this man for, God, seems like forever now. He is a horror author. His name is Rick Powell, and he lives up in a very cold place called Oak Forest, Illinois, with his son Brad. Rick is an absolute lover of horror and dark fiction, and his poetry and stories have appeared in Radical Dislocations, Walloom's Library, Satan's Holiday, Welcome to Your Nightmare, Blessings from the Darkness, The Nightmare Engine, Dark Eclipse Magazine, Shadows and Light Magazine, Twisted Dreams Magazine. He's going to have to pronounce the next one because I can't pronounce it. Uh, Temporary Skeletons Don't Look Back. 13 Terrifying Tales of Urban Folklore, Ladies and Gentlemen of Horror, 2014, My Friend, Hydra Stars, Infernal Ink Magazine, Toys in the Attic, Cherry Nose Armageddon, and so many others. This man's short stories and dark poetry are things that nightmares are made of. If you love artists like Edgar Allan Poe and... Thomas Leggetti and Arthur McCain and Ramsey Campbell. Yeah, you will like Rick. Hello, my friend. How are you this evening? Hello, Yvonne. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I am so grateful and so appreciative that you are spending an hour with me tonight. What a way to 
start off the silly season with <laughs> horror. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Makes me happy. Yeah. <laughs> hey, there's nothing more horrifying than going into this season, I'll tell you that. I'm telling you. That's why I try to do all my Christmas shopping online, because I, I, I hate dealing with all those people and all those crowds. So you will have to pronounce the one place where your stories have appeared that I can't pronounce. starts with a C. Oh, uh, uh, Cthulhu Haiku. That's, uh, it's, uh, it's a book of haiku and poetry, and I had uh, one of my poems in there. It's, uh, um, Cthulhu is basically a, a creation of H.P. Lovecraft, and um, the man that got that together, that uh, Cthulhu Haiku, um, it was um, Lester Smith. And um, every once in a while, he puts out books asking for poetry submissions or haiku. And um, that was one, uh, one of my works was in there. Well, I'll have to check him out because if it's Lovecraft-based, we all know how we all love Lovecraft. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So, and that segues into, you've listened to enough of my shows that before we start talking about your wonderful product, let's talk about the man himself. How in the world did you get to where you are today and practicing your craft and honing your craft and sending chills down the backbones of your readers? What prompted you to take this path as opposed to something else? Well, I've been, you know, a lover of horror and uh, dark fiction my whole life since I was a small child. Um, I grew up in the south side of Chicago here with you know, watching Creature Features, Twilight Zone, Outer Limits. I mean, I was always that weird kid that always uh, loved the uh, horror movies and comic books and um I basically never grew out of it since I was a child. And um, about four or five years ago, I was going through a tough personal time myself. And um, I was in a very dark place. And I started writing poetry to help me get through it. And um, then some incidents has happened, uh, you know, a year after that where um, I lost uh, two two people that meant the world to me. Um, you know, I lost my wife and after that I lost my brother and I just started going more into my writing and poetry. And that's basically, uh, basically saved my life was my writing and, uh, you know, my son and, um, you know, just getting through life. So, uh, basically, uh, just the writing, I just totally just delved into it and, um, it, it really took off. And, um, you know, it, it's been going pretty well, and I enjoy it. People read it, and they enjoy it, and it just started going from there. When you started down this writing path, was it something that you had thought about doing as a child or in school, or was it just something that morphed because you had to expel those feelings of darkness before it overtook you? Basically, it was very therapeutic. Um, it was cathartic. I just was reading a lot of Poe, and uh, I was digging into a lot of books. And I just, uh, December 20th of 2012, I remember the day I was at the woods, and I started uh, writing my first poem. And it was after I was reading, H, uh, reading Edgar Allan Poe's um, Annabelle Lee. And I just started you know, writing a few sentences. And then after that, I finished one poem. Then after that, I wrote another and another. And within about a year, I had about 50, 50 poems. And I looked at it and I think, and I wrote all these? <laughs> Where did these come from? And um, I, you know, uh, contacted, uh, I sent in a poem to a, um, a book. And it was called Radical Dislocations. And in the meantime, I contacted Hydra Star about um, sending up a short story, and everything just started going through there. And um, I, you know, she helped me publish my first book of poetry. And um, Dave Lipscomb was, did the cover for that, uh, "My Soul Stain, My Seed Sour," and um, it just took off from there. And I just got the itch, and um, 
it started getting into my blood, and I just kept running with it. Well, what I find interesting, because you've known me long enough to know that that I am a lover of Poe, and for Annabelle Lee, which was not the darker of his poems, inspired you, is interesting to me because, as you may or may not know, when he wrote The Raven, his wife was dying, and he Mm -hmm. was wondering how he was going to grieve Mm -hmm. because none of us know. It's it's a personal thing with, with every different death, and none of us know how we're going to grieve or how long we're going to grieve or what's going to happen when we grieve. So he's writing this, and then after she died, he wrote Annabelle Lee, which was for him cathartic. So for mm-hmm. you to be reading such a beautiful, sweet, loving poem to help you grieve, which is what you were doing, and to help you start healing says a lot for that particular piece because it's not dark. It's not um, top. It's it's a poem of love. Yeah. Yeah, I never noticed that before because right now I talk to a few people that read some of my stories and poems and they point things out to me and I'm thinking, Really? I, I, I never noticed that. You know, I mean, I just started writing to get through some personal demons, you might say. And um, I just kept writing because I started to really enjoy it. And I started delving myself into my work. And um, that helped a lot, you know. And um, basically, I, you know, it developed into um, some personal philosophies. And I you know, been a little bit stronger because of it. So writing really helped. And it's kind of weird because, you know, the horror genre is not what people would think. Oh, how could that help you move on? I mean, that stuff's so dark. That stuff's so, you know, horrifying and stuff and so depressing. Well, basically it's just kind of expurging some things into a page and taking that ink and using his life's blood and, now that it's all over with, I'm thinking, okay, this I took something negative and made it positive, and that's well. Uh, yeah, what people don't what people don't realize is within all of us there is darkness because darkness and light one cannot really exist without the other, and we all have that darkness in us. And it's like, which wolf do you see? We always have the evil wolf and the good wolf. And what you did, rather than internalize all of that darkness that was in you, you let it out. And it became a positive thing to the pain you were feeling. And and sometimes the world is dark. That's just the nature mm-hmm. of it. Yeah. Yeah, I I didn't think of it at the time, but then I started thinking about what uh, Robert Block once said, uh, the man who wrote Psycho, and he's a famous horror writer. One of the things he always said was, uh, the darkest place in the whole world is inside the human skull. (laughs) I was thinking, yeah, he's kind of right there because, you know, sometimes I write some stuff. Yeah, and one time, sometimes I write some stuff and I read through it, I was thinking, wait a minute, where did this come from? You know, and, (laughs) you know. (laughs) <laughs> Maybe I'm well, more demented it, than I know, you know. We were we were discussing some of the authors that you read and that you studied and one of them is is uh Thomas Ligeti and and we were discussing mm-hmm. the fact that he suffers from chronic anxiety. Mhm. Yes. Yes, and, and um, it, if you read his stuff, you could <laughs> tell. <laughs> yeah. But it's probably like a therapy session for him to write it because it is so um, obsessive within him, his psychic, that he would probably go completely mad without it. Yeah, it's very nihilistic when he writes. You know, he could always uh, see that there's no uh, no shining rainbow at the end of the story, you know, but that's, uh, that's just how he flows. And um, it, he's very unique in, in, the writing, in the writing world. So, and very, you know, unknown, but, you know, except for 
the people that, you know, know about Lovecraft and such, you could see that, so. Well, Mozart was the same way. Some of the pieces yes, that yes. he wrote were extremely dark. Mm-hmm. And he he suffered from depression. Yeah. Mhm. Did we see a pattern here, Rick? <laughs> I guess we do see a pattern. Yes, we do. <laughs> We're all slightly crazy. <laughs> yeah, well, hey, I mean, normal people scare me. Trust me. Well, they, they scare me, too. <laughs> I really worry about the normal people. <laughs> so your your first book, you donate all of that proceeds to the American Heart Association. Yeah, my first book of poetry, My Soul Stained, My Seed Sour. Um, that was basically where I just took all my poems. I didn't really categorize them. I just threw them into a book, basically, put it out there, you know, just, you know, took a chance. And um, I decided, um, I got an inspiration from uh, Jennifer Miller. She uh, does the Ladies and Gentlemen of Horror series. Um, every year she gets um, authors together and she donates her proceeds of her book to the American Cancer Society. Well, a couple of years ago I was in her anthology and that gave me the idea that, okay, I'm going to take my book of poetry and I'm donating all the proceeds of that to the American Heart Association because, uh, you know, my, uh, my, my late wife, she, um, she, she passed away through, you know, um, heart, heart condition. So that's why I'm taking all the proceeds from these that first book and just everything I make from that I just donate. Is that like a healing process for you as well to to feel like that and you are you're making a difference because we know that every penny counts but to feel like that you're contributing to something that might save someone else's loved one from the same fate that your wife suffered? Yeah, um, I just feel it's something I have to do. I mean, there's it's hard to put a reason to it, but it's it just like I said, you know, I I try to take my work and especially my poetry, something negative, and turn it into something positive. And you know, I'm trying and going through life with that positive outlook. So that's why I take this, all these dark poems, all this dark writing, and turning it around and doing something good with it. So it's just and, something I have to do. And that brings me to a question, and that is how many people do we both know, of course we both know a bunch, who have allowed the darkness in their life take over their life as opposed to putting a, a candle in the middle of that darkness and and putting light back into their world and what it does to them. Yeah, I'm, I know a lot of people there. I, I have some some people close to me going through some tough times now, and um, I'm, I'm trying to help them out as much as possible. And, yeah, it's uh, there's a lot going on with uh, loved ones and other friends that um, – you know, you really don't know what they go through unless you've been there yourself. And uh, four or five years ago, I was in their place big time. So one of the reasons I'm still here is because of the writing. And I, uh, if I didn't start writing, I don't know where I'd be right now. So, yeah. Well, and, and this this time of year is, I call it the silly season, but it, it's really a yeah. it's it's really a sad season because this time of year is when there's more domestic abuse, mm-hmm. there's yeah. more suicides, there's mm-hmm. more domestic murders, there's more of everything that has to do with the negativity of the human soul than any other time of mm-hmm. the year. And right. I don't, yeah. I don't know if it has to do with the over commercialization, if it has to do with some families don't get along, so ergo they don't get together. 
some people just have nobody because maybe everybody mm-hmm. around them has died, they're elderly. Or if there's a trigger from a childhood that causes people to stay stuck in that darkness. If you Mm -hmm. were to give someone some advice about how to break that way of life because they're stuck, it's like grief. You know, you can get stuck in grief and and not move forward. If you were to get, because you've been there, if you were to give someone some helpful hints, we won't say advice, but let's say helpful suggestions of how to get past that darkness and move forward because we all know that's what our loved ones want us to do. They don't want us to stay stuck in that past because mm-hmm. it's not healthy for one thing. If you were able to to give someone some helpful suggestions, what would you tell them? Well, a couple of things. One, I would say don't don't let pride run your life. Ask for help if you need it. You know, ask ask someone. You know, don't don't go into that area alone, you know, and, you know, everybody's going to need some help sometimes. So you, you got to be there to, you know, ask and, you know, just say, Hey, I need some help here. Even if it's just to talk to someone or if it's just someone that's a sounding board. And another thing is, is too, is if you can't, if you have to use some means to get it out there, either by writing, painting, music, you know, there's a, don't be afraid to try something that will help get you through the next day. So that's, you know, just write write something, a poem, let you know how you feel. You know, that, that's helped. That's very cathartic. And or draw a picture, you know, paint something. That that helps and, you know, you you may think it sucks, but other people don't. So and that that will help bleed everything out you might say use the arts and think you know you're 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 number one you know no one else is like you you know there you got to watch out for yourself you know your own personal um survival is key would it be safe to say or make the suggestion that that person who's in that dark place only look forward to the next five minutes. Don't overwhelm themselves by saying, "Well, tomorrow I got to do this," or "Tomorrow this is going to happen," or "Tomorrow I've got to face life without so and so," or "Tomorrow." When all they have to do is get through the next moment in time, because really, that's mm-hmm. that's the only time we're promised. Mm-hmm. So. I mean, there's there's a lot to live through in life, so I mean, there's a lot to look forward to, and you know, just uh, get through the next heartbeat, the next breath, you know, and a day above ground is a good day. <laughs> and and the older I get, the more I appreciate that saying because you're right. <laughs> even yeah. even with with the health problems that someone has, and God knows my husband has a multitude of them. Every oh, day yeah. that we have is oh, not even every day, but every minute that we have is a blessing because mm-hmm. I may wake up one day and he not there, and then I'll sit yeah. back and kick myself and say, well, I, I should have, I would have, I could have, I should have not um, mm-hmm. thought about next week or what we're going to do three years from now. I should have just lived in the moment. Mm-hmm. That's what a lot of people got to start doing, you know. I mean, that's – I don't speak for everybody. Everybody has their own thing. But, I mean, just just being here, you know, just being here, you know, and just breathing, you know. That's uh, getting it through. And it's uh, that's probably why I have a fascination with horror so much is because, you know, as Lovecraft once said, you know, the, the strongest uh, the strongest emotion to man is fear. And the strongest fear around is fear of the unknown. And if that doesn't say what horror is all about, that's it right there. You know, it's uh, it's not always the axe murderer or the werewolf or the vampire. It's always that atmosphere and that feeling. 
and that's it has a sort of magic right there, which is kind of weird in the same conver- conversation. But that's uh, that's that that horror genre is a genre that's unlike anything else. And that is true because it is true horror is the fear of not knowing, of the unknown, of Mm -hmm. speculating and expecting the worst, and it might be ten times worse or it might not be bad at all. But the Mm -hmm. ultimate fear is that fear of the unknown. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and um, Alfred Hitchcock was one of the greats. Oh yeah. Mhm. Oh because yeah. His, he was, he was his, else. Because his shows always, when the when the the viewer was watching one of his movies, you knew you knew something was going to happen. You mm-hmm. didn't see it happen because it it was a visual only in your head. Psycho comes to mind. Yeah, and, you, um, you know... Go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. You're first. Um, you didn't see Janet Lee get brutally murdered. You mm-hmm. saw the shadow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's one thing he said in an interview about filmmaking. He says, you know, you could be watching in a movie theater, watching a movie, then a bomb goes off inside the movie or whatever, you know, or something shocking happens for a second. And you're thinking, okay, oh, the, the audience is shocked. But if you show that, you know, there's a ticking bomb or whatever, or there's a stalker moving close to the victim that doesn't notice them, the people in the audience will be saying, look behind you, look behind you, look out, you know. And that's the one thing that Hitchcock did well was, like, he left that suspense and that terror linger, you know, for moments. And that was a certain magic right there, you know. Do you think we've gotten away from the magic of pure horror? Hmm. I think, personally, that a lot of society has been desensitized because there's they don't have that awe and wonder about horror that we had grown up. I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, all the slasher movies, all, everything's gore and CGI effects and stuff like that nowadays. Yeah, of course, that took away from some of the magic. There, uh, uh, horror comes in waves. It comes high and low, you know, especially the books and the movies. Right now, we're at like a low, you know, there's the originality is kind of like at a standstill. But it, it, it'll, it'll hit peaks and valleys. And basically, like they said, the last five six years, you know, some of the horror movies that I've seen or something else has been kind of like lackluster and watered down. Maybe I'm biased, (laughs) but um, (laughs) it's going to happen again. I mean, right now you see, um, you don't see a lot of horror just in horror movies and and books, but in other genres, which is coming around. You know, there's some dramas and stuff and some others that have that tinge that, you know, that that's getting it. So, one of the, the another of the greats that comes to mind. It was the first horror movie I ever saw, and it's one of the things that turned really turned me on to to Poe and to Vincent Price was The House of Usher. Ah, yes, Roger Corman. Yes. 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 Because it was pure, unadulterated, edge of your seat, nail biting. Teeth grinding horror. Mm-hmm. Oh, Vincent Price was he—he he was the master at that. If they couldn't have picked a better person for that, and especially the, in that movie, uh, Corman knew how to use the colors and how to use all the actors, even the costumes in there was used perfectly for, you know, the House of Usher. So I mean, you know, especially the paintings on the wall. Um, yes. You know. Yeah, those paintings <laughs> you can never forget. So yeah, and and everything that he put into the the set of that movie had a meaning, a subtle meaning. Oh yeah. Mhm. And it, yeah. and I was 
I was probably 13 maybe when I went to see it, and I was hmm. I think I might have really been too young to appreciate the full effect because I had not really been I love the Raven, but it didn't dawn on me that the House of Usher was posed. I just know mm-hmm. that it that was the best movie I had ever ever seen. Mm-hmm. And I've I've had the mm-hmm. the ability to see it again as I got older, and you have to sit and totally focus on it to fully appreciate what he did with that piece of of literature. Because reading it was bad enough. And I don't mean in a bad way, but it was spooky enough reading it. But to see it on the big screen and and hearing the the fingernails in the casket, and mm-hmm. you just didn't know what she was going to do. Mhm. Yeah. So I mean, that's that's. I think that's where a lot of us horror authors and people that love the genre come from. Comes right from the childhood. Because one of the things I remember when I was growing up is I used to watch Night Gallery with Rod Serling. And I remember I used to keep my hand over my eyes, but peeking through my fingers, <laughs> you know. And, uh, you know, Frankenstein and Dracula from Creature Features at 1030 at night, you know. Uh, yeah, so it's it's ingrained in us from a very early age. <laughs> and, you know, that's how you, we grew up. Do so. you think that... Do you think that horror and and I know the house of usher was done in technicolor but it was a mm-hmm. subtle technicolor but the thing the the original dracula movie with lon chaney it mm-hmm. was black and white to me mm-hmm. that is a classic that the the dracula movies that we do today are too in your face and they're too bold well they're i mean it, it's you know black and white and color could be done in two different ways. I mean there are some uh, color versions now that are pretty good because you know they, it, it's it doesn't matter what's in your face or the color, but it's the atmosphere. It's got to have an atmosphere and a soundtrack. Right. Everything's got to blend together in one perfect you know vision. So yeah. I just I just find it interesting that. Lon Chaney's Dracula had more of an impact on me as a child mm-hmm. than, yeah. let's say, um, Anne Rice's The Vampire, Interview with a Vampire. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Be- because yeah, it- I don't know if it was the dynamic. I don't know if it – and when I say the colors are too bold, it, it, to me, I equate color with um, – Action and setting, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and the colors were too. Maybe bold is not a right word. They were too bright for because mm-hmm. Dracula is not a colorful creature. He's a creature of the night. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's um yeah it's uh we can go in, I, I, it's ironically um. Coincidentally enough, I'm researching vampires right now for a podcast I'm going to be doing in about a week. So, yeah, I've been uh, going into, like, the vampire literature myself and some of the vampire movies. And, yeah, basically you are correct because the black and white and with the classic monsters work a little bit more well than modern day. But there are some modern day films out there, you know, like about 10 years ago that take a good swing at it. And uh, they do pretty well. Um, one good of it is Near Dark by Catherine Bigelow that came out back in the late 80s that took the vampire genre and threw it out there. And um, there's um, George Romero did one called Martin where the vampire is totally different. I mean, I don't want to get off on a tangent here, but um, um, people are more than look, welcome to look those up. And anything horror genre, movie or book that takes something classic and turns it into a different direction, it could either be a hit or a miss. And, Uh you know, most of the time it's a hit and sometimes it is a miss, but that's just how it goes with uh, the genre itself. Well, I just find it all very interesting because like you say, horror is the fear of the unknown, whether it be vampires, Mm -hmm. whether it be the souls within ourselves. And, and, 
we are sometimes we are our own horror story. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That Expound on right that there. a little bit. Expound on that a little bit, Rick. Hmm. <clears throat> it's always that fine line within ourselves that we could create our own horror or create our own you know, path of least resistance. Um, there are most of the horror I find within quote unquote human beings is the horror of the decisions they make, you know, in like a split second or things they've done in the past. Um, that's why, you know, my, my second book of poetry, more regrets than glories is basically a companion volume. And, um, that's basically the soul of that, pardon the word, soul of that one is basically, uh, you know, the choices you make and the consequences that happen from those choices. Um, you know, the the one in there, um, that's where I get the title for, More Regrets Than Glories, and in that second book is, um, <laughs> I had so many here, I'm drawing a blank. Um I'll have to come to it right now. I don't have it in front of me. <laughs> but um, it's okay. about a man in a, a man in a theater. Um, and basically, that was basically inspired by Thomas Ligotti, um, where a man goes into a theater all alone. And in that theater, on the screen, is like everything he's done bad in his life. And he leaves the theater basically empty with thinking, okay, where do I go to now? So that's what's really, really different in that poem that I wrote. So um, that's so that's a sell write, it all right there. Do you write more poetry as opposed to short stories, or do you just write all poetry? Well, I do write short stories. I started writing poetry um, as a way of, like, you know, throwing some of the horror in there. Um Poetry and short stories are two separate things. Poetry to me is basically like the snacks you could have during the day, the little tidbits, the little morsels you could have during the day. Um, short stories are more like, okay, you're going to have a meal. <laughs> Here's what you do for the <laughs> recipe to make a short story. Poetry is a little bit easier to write. Um, short stories are more of a challenge. And, um, yeah, in that, um, to go back to that, that was Old Theater was my poem about that. That's where I got the title for More Regrets Than Glories. The title is a, basically part of that poem from Old Theater. Um, and so right now I'm trying to challenge myself every time I write something. Um, I started out with poetry. I wrote some short stories. I just finished a novella, believe it or not, that I'm in the process of getting um, – edited and hopefully published next year. And um, so I always try to challenge myself a little bit more when I write. So, and it's, uh, you know, I always try to raise that bar a little bit more. Which do you like writing better, the short stories or the poetry? Hmm, that's a good question. Well, the poetry is good whenever I want to take a refresher and just like step, step away from writing the novel or novel novella or short story. And I go into a poem. Um, poems are like, you know, quicker and it's, you're able to concentrate, you know, a scene very short in a certain amount of words. Um, I do like writing short stories now. I, I'm more partial to that because I'm able to get my voice a little bit more and get my teeth into it, <laughs> pardon, the, pardon the words, when I uh, write a short story. So, um, you know, there's always that one thing is whenever you're writing a short story, I, I, I found a few times when I write or I hit a certain sentence or I write a certain paragraph and I read through it and I'm thinking, yeah, this is it. I did it, you know, and this is what I meant to say. So it's uh, – it's a little bit more satisfying now as I evolved that short stories are, uh, I, I'm really getting my gut in there now. Do you ever see yourself writing a full horror book? Uh, like a, like a novel? Yes. Or I thought about that. 
Um, but like I said, this novella I just wrote, that took me like a year to write <laughs> because, you know, I'm, I, I work full time. I work in a restaurant six days a week, you know, and uh, with life and everything else, you know, I, I try to take every day to write something, either, you know, a couple sentences or maybe a couple hundred words. I try each day to do something with my writing. Yeah, I have passed around the idea in my head of writing a novel. Um Right now, that probably be on the back burner because um, one other thing I'm working on now is I'm taking some of my short stories and I'm going to put them in book form. I'm in the process of getting a book, a short story collection together. So um, there's a lot on the burners right now, you know, a lot of ideas passing around. And, uh, yeah, yeah I, I would like to try to do that, yes. Well, I know that the short stories of yours that I have read, and as well as your poetry, I'm thinking to myself as I'm reading this, okay, I want to know more. Why did he hmm. stop here? That wasn't very <laughs> nice of him. <laughs> <laughs> I've had people mention that. They're thinking, wait a minute, you could have wrote this longer or you could have done, you know, done this or why didn't you explain that? You know, when I, when I write a story and I read through it, I try to leave a little bit of ambiguity in there, a little bit of mystery in everything I write. You know, it's 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 not good to like explain everything. You got to let the reader judge for themselves on a few things. Sure, I, I agree. Mean, I, I, because yeah, if, I, you, I, if, if you give the reader everything, then what's the point? Yeah, yeah. So sometimes you got to leave the shape underneath the sheet. You can't like oh, pull that sheet back to look what's under there. You got to leave a little something under there. Um, and then let them use yeah, their own I, imagination to figure it out. Right. I mean, I'm 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 not a professional by no means. You know, I just write because I have something to say and I like writing. You know, I mean, you know, will I ever get to a bestseller status? Will I ever get awards? I, no, I don't think I'm far from that right now. I mean, I'm just, I have a story to say and it's just so damn fun just to write. And, you know, sometimes to unnerve some people that, you know, I get, I get a um, perverse thrill out of doing that. But maybe that just says a lot about me. Well, you think about it. If if we tell everything or we don't allow the audience to draw their own conclusion in some things, mm -hmm. they don't keep coming back because they know what to expect. Mhm. Mm yeah. And and we want them to become addicted to us. Mhm. Mm yeah. Mhm. Mm and then on so, some level, we might not even know the end of the story. That is right because um, you know, I just I just, you know, a lot of people say do you do research? Do you do a look a lot of stuff up? I says, well, do you write out an outline? Do you write out a plan? I just listen to what the muse is telling me. You know, when I write something, I just let the story flow. I know, When I write, I know the beginning and I know the end. It's all that crap in the center I have trouble with. <laughs> <laughs> and, you of know, course, if you, mean, if you ignore the muses, they're going to shut up and you're not going to be able to do anything because they're going to be mad at you for at least a month. Oh, uh, my muse is sadistic, I tell you that. I mean, I could be, you know, I, I could sit in front of the keyboard for like an hour and a half thinking, oh, Know what letters look like, but I could wake up at two in the morning, or I could be driving to work, and then the story hits me, and I'm thinking, "Oh, are you kidding me now?" You know, so yeah. That's why you need a tape recorder with you, so you can, uh, or, or your little smartphone, hit record, and let the muse talk, and people will think you've lost your mind because you're sitting there talking to yourself while you're going to work. But it works. Yeah, well, I already have people think I'm totally fruit nutty already as it is, so I'm not worried about that. Well, so. that's okay. Let them think that. <laughs> as, as Alice told the Mad Hatter, which is one of my favorite lines in the entire story, the Hatter said, I'm crazy. That's why I'm mad as a Hatter. And she says, the yeah. best people are. So, yeah, mm -hmm. we are the best people. And if it weren't for us being crazy or mad, or in anything in between, I can guarantee you that 99% of the population would have absolutely no entertainment. 
<laughs> you got that right. Yeah. Hmm. So we do serve hmm. a purpose. Yeah. Yeah. This is true. <laughs> Strange though it might be, we do serve a purpose, and there are those mm. that are as twisted as we are. Yeah. If, how did you get hooked up with Hydra and um, the ladies and gentlemen of Hara? I know how you got hooked up with me. It's just one of those things we all fell yeah. in together all those many years ago. But how mm-hmm. did you get hooked up with Juan Lam's library and uh, the haiku and and Hydra? It was just like um, a a chain of people. I mean, um, you know, when I, I've known Hydra since MySpace days. Uh, Yeah, that is a long time ago. That is a long time ago. Yeah. I've known her that long too. (laughs) And, um, you know, when I, after I did my book, you know, book of poetry, you know, and uh, she had the, her magazine, Infernal Link Magazine, which is erotic horror. And um, I've I've always enjoyed that. I've always enjoyed the, you know, the the genre or the stories that like totally blow it out of the water. That usually just break the barriers down. And Infernal Link Magazine does that. You know, you really don't see erotic horror anywhere. And um, right. I tried my hand, at, and my first short story was Patient 151, which is erotic horror. And I wrote it, and I sub- and I and I just sent it to her on a whim, and I said, "Hey, um, you know, read this. What do you think of it?" And she says, "You know, I like this. I want to put it in my magazine." And that totally blew me away. I didn't think, you know, this would, you know, take off like it did. And um, that, uh, of course, that story I wrote is like one of my most extreme stories as far as uh, sexual and graphic content. I just took a lot of personal. Um, you know, personal ideas and threw it into there. And um, that's, and ever since then, you know, every uh, once in a while I submit a few poems to her or another story. And um, she referred me to um, a few people. And that's where I heard about Jennifer Miller from Ladies and Gentlemen of Horror. And, um, you know, and Jennifer is fantastic. I mean, what she does with that book every year and the quality of writers and um, the content, and it all goes to a fantastic cause. Uh, hers is don't all the proceeds donate to the American Cancer Cancer Society, and um, yeah, and uh, so I just um, and basically Walloom's Library, um, you know, she referred me to um, Andrea Van Stoyk over there, and um, you know, and, and I just it just started, you know. Uh, snowballing to a few other people and a few other anthologies, and um, you know, I just that's how it goes. You just got to get a network going. You know, um, if anybody out there is interested in submitting, um, you know, just just get in some groups. You know, some Facebook groups or whatever, Twitter, social media, friends, and Come on don't the be show. afraid to put it out there. They have a show, Come on. you know. Come on, my on show. Von Mason show. There you go. Yvonne Mason's off the chain. It's there you go. Shameless okay. plug there. <laughs> hey, nothing shameless about plugging, I tell you. So But but it's and, um, but it's true because and and this segues into something like I said, we always go off script here because there is no script, but this segues into we as an indie community we all come together to help each other to succeed. And it's not mm-hmm. done for any self glory but because when that person succeeds, then we succeed. We all succeed together. We all mm-hmm. we all feel like that when one of us does something really, really great, we've all done it because we've all been with that person and encouraged that person and been a part of that person's life and helped them on their journey. So mm-hmm. we're a very tight-knit community. Yeah, yeah, and... Um... You know, of all the, you know, independent writers that I met on the path here, you know, I've I've met a lot of people that encourage other people, you know, or, and give honest criticism. And um, that, that helps anybody grow, be it a writer, musician, artist. You know, I uh, one thing I always try to do with uh, my books is I always try to get some other people that I know involved, um, like John Souter for some of my book and my short stories for Kindle. 
you know, I always told them, hey, you know, I want to hire you or whatever, and, you know, and I'll promote your work, you promote mine. And, um, you know, and that's, it just starts a network. And, um, you know, like my collection of poetry, More Regrets Than Glories, I worked with um, Amanda Parker. Um, She was, you know, one of the people that are crucial for that second book of poetry is uh, she helped me do the layout. And um, each section of that book of poetry is a stanza from one of her own poems. So wow. and everything, yeah, yeah. So um, her and I got our heads together with that, and um, I, you know, she had a poem that she wrote that she published a while ago, and I says, "Here's what I want to do. I want to try to take your poem and have it as an opening line for each of the chapters, you know." And um, you know, so it's 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 all just you know getting people together that you know and working together, you know, in whatever artistic ability that you have. And just it'll help you grow and help you learn. I mean, as far as editing, I, my my editing skills will, uh, leave a lot to be desired. <laughs> so I'm, you know, I, that's I always work with other people. Hydra, you know, she edits a lot of my stuff, and she's fantastic at it. And you know, and you know, you just gotta you know get it out there. You know, and if I give advice to anybody, be afraid. If you have something you wrote and you're afraid of getting rejected get rejected. I mean, because it's, it's going to happen, especially in the writing world. I mean, you know, that don't, don't take it personally because if you write something, if you paint something, if you make a song, sing a song or write a poem, just remember one thing. You created something that no one else has ever created. You have something unique. And, and, and what our group, our little Phoenix Writers Group has helped a lot of people come out of their shell. Have you noticed that? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And um, there was a couple of my friends that were afraid to publish, and it took me a while. And I just told them, "Hey, you know, don't put it out there. You know, if if you're gonna get bad criticism, if people are gonna say it sucks, some people will like it. I mean, it just it's yours. It is yours. You know, don't be and afraid to put it out there." And it's and it's their dream, mm-hmm. and they should yeah. never allow someone else to steal that dream because they don't have their permission to steal that dream. No, not at all. You know that you, you, you know, as far as a writing, if, you, if this is your love to do it, or if you're, you know, a painter or an artist, this is yours. No one could take that away from you. And no one else can do it like you can do it either, because no one can write mm-hmm. the kind of stuff you write, I'm going to tell you. Ladies and gentlemen, I, <laughs> if you have not read Rick Powell's literature, you got to go and read it, because it is absolutely magnificent. It is old-time horror, and if you're fans of old-time horror, that's what Rick writes, because those were his influences. If you're lovers of Thomas Leggetti or Poe or... Arthur McCain or Ramsey Campbell or Lovecraft, mm-hmm. then yeah. Rick Powell is your guy because he he will leave you going, what? I need more <laughs> of this. I got to go get another yeah. fix here. <laughs> I've had one person say to me, you know, she, she says, I like what you wrote, but it was really bizarre. And I thought, Okay, well, I did my job. I mean, <laughs> you know, that's... Your job I mean, here is done it, now. <laughs> so, I mean, that's... I mean, 90% of the time, I, I write because it's something I would like to read. You know? Yes. I write what I would like to read. And that's basically it right there. So, you just follow what's in your gut, you know? Well, you, you do a fantastic job of it. An absolutely Thank fantastic you very much. Job. You've been in how many of my books now? Three, two, three? Three, three, yeah, three, three of them, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah and Welcome to Your Nightmare, uh, Saints Holiday, and Blessings from the Darkness. Yeah, those three, yeah. And I'm going to tell you, his his stuff, just it'll just reach out and grab you by the throat and shake you till you turn blue. <laughs> it's that good. Well, <laughs> things nightmares are I'm, made of. Well, I, I'm I'm very self-critical of my work. I mean, it's just like I don't see it that way. Some people do, you know. I I appreciate the 
Thank you very much for the kind words. That means a lot. I only speak the truth. You, how, you know me long enough. I pull no punches, right? <laughs> not you. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I just call it like it is. Not like I said, but just like it is. <laughs> Tell the folks, my friend, where you can be found, where your work can be found, and how people can get in contact with you. Because well, I know after tonight, people are going to be looking for author Rick Powell. I'm mostly on Facebook. I do have a Goodreads page, and I might have an Amazon page where you can find most of my um, short stories are for Kindle format. Um, I do have. Um, you know, my poetry books are available on Lulu, and uh, they are available on Kim, uh, Amazon for Kindle, too. And, um, you know, just contact me through Facebook. Um, you know, like I said, you know, um, my, of my two poetry books that are in print now, uh, the first one, My Soul Stay, My Seed Sour, that one is um, all the proceeds go to uh, the American Heart Association. Um, and I do have a follow-up book of poetry that is just, you know, personal for myself that uh, me and Mandy Parker worked on. And, uh, you know, um, I'm always looking, you know, for any honest critique, anybody that's interested. And um, if they want to contact me, just uh, go through Facebook or, uh, you know, Goodreads, and I'm on there. And you are coming back after the first of the year. We talked about this on the show. I'd be more than happy to, yeah. Um, I know we, um, you know, didn't talk about um, a few other uh, publications that I'll be in, but I'd be more than happy to uh, come on again, Yvonne. I'd be honored. And when you, and when you come back, I want you to have your your latest "More Regrets Than Glory" because I want you to read some of your work, and let's give these people a taste of their new addiction. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I'd I'd be more than happy to. So yes, thank you. And then we can analyze them. We can talk about what, what, what was the reason behind this point? What, what do you, what were you thinking, or or what was the motive? Because every true poem, there's a motive, whether it's conscious or unconscious. There's always a motive. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's. Um, I can't think of anything right now, but I know as I go through all the poems. Yeah, I could probably uh, go through what was picking through my brain at the time. So, yeah. Uh Yep. So you can be found on Facebook. You can be found on Goodreads. Your books can be found on Lulu, also on Kindle. And and Or Amazon, yes. Or Amazon. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, if you like the writings of Poe, of Leggetti, of McCain, of Campbell, of H.P. Lovecraft, uh, hell for that matter, from some even as far back as the the author of Dr. Frankenstein, Dracula, Bram Stoker, you will want to read Rick's poetry and his short stories because they are written in that type of dichotomy. They're they're dark, but they leave the reader going, I want more, or there's a tingling down my spine that I can't make stop because I can't stop thinking about this. Yeah, well, um, uh, thank you. Yeah, I tried to do all old school horror with some of my stuff. So, I mean, um, you know, when uh, hopefully next year when my book of short stories will come out and um, I'm going to be working on some darker stuff in the interim. So, yeah. Well, with that, I'm going to say thank you very much for being on my show and spending an hour with me. I'm very honored, and I appreciate it so, so much. We're going to have you back next year. And, ladies and gentlemen, remember, this is the last show for this Next Wednesday, we start back up at 8 o'clock Eastern time with Tom Fertrell, a.k.a. T.G. Reaper, this is Off the Chain. Uh, the music tonight was by Cypher called Dark Mistress. Go out and get it. It's a, it's an, This is an amazing band out of Canada, and it just fit tonight's show so well. I am your host, Yvonne Mason, and as all of you know, 
We are always off the chain on this show. If you want to be on the show, contact me. Had a guy contact me today out of the blue. Don't know where he heard about me, but apparently he listened to the show, and he will be on the show. So contact me, whether you have a platform, a business, you're a musician, you're an artist, you're a writer, you're whatever. That's why we call it off the chain. So until next Wednesday night, November the 30th, 8 p.m. sharp, be there. This is Yvonne, and this is Off the Chain, and I say good night. Hang on just a second, Rick, until we go off the air. Now we are off the air, and I wanted to say real quickly, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And Hopefully it went well. Oh, it went very well, because we we talked about things, but we went totally off the chain, because one thing (laughs) led to another, which led to another, which led to another, which is the way this show runs. (laughs) And I appreciate I appreciate you sharing that personal part of your life with me because I really believe that that you're going to touch someone from this show tonight who's who's hurting and who needed to hear that it's okay to hurt, but it's even more okay to move on. Mm-hmm. Thank you. You're welcome, Thank my you. dear, and I will I will get these shows up on the podcast. I will put them up on Facebook, and I'll, it might be in the morning, and I'll tag you. And then please use this to promote yourself. Thank you. I will. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, all right, my dear, and I'll get you set up for next year. I'll send you a date, and if it works, let me know. If not, we'll do something else. Gotcha. All right, my dear. Until then, good evening and happy Thanksgiving. Same to you also. Thank you. All right, darling. Good night. Good night. Record better audio anywhere with Motive Digital Microphones from Shure. Easy-to-use options like the MV88 plug directly into your phone or computer and include a free app. Create studio-quality sound for podcasts, music, and videos. Visit Shure.com to learn more. This holiday season, give more wow from the mills, and you'll hear more, oh, you shouldn't have, more, you're the best, more, how did you know, and even more, I love you. Give more wow for the holidays from the mills. Knockout brands, knockout prices. At Sawgrass Mills, we're ready for the holidays. On Thanksgiving Day, doors open at 10 a.m. and stay open until midnight. On Black Friday, shop from 6 a.m. until 10 p.m. For more info, visit sawgrassmills.com. Sawgrass Mills, a Simon Center.